Um, so, um, um, so I'm going to go through, basically go through reproducible research from and touch on more study design, statistical perspectives, and perspectives of uh, data analysis, um, and and, um, um, and how we often fail um, at these levels to to produce studies that are reproducible. Um, and I'm going to talk. Um, I'm going to focus in on one issue that um, I, I don't feel like has probably gotten quite as much of attention as it really deserves in, in, in the literature on reproducible research, um, which what, what is what statisticians refer to as the error term and coming up with the appropriate error term. And this is something that in the statistical world was central to the development of statistics. Go, goes way back to agricultural experiments in the 40s and 50s. So it's this very, very standard statistical concept. Um, and it, it's come out in medicine as well, um, um, yet you still find many, 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 many errors made um, and, and a lot of confusions with respect to this. Um, as a prelude, um, I, I thought I would go through um, implications of statistical power um, um, and, and some of the other issues that cause um, the, this problem of having um, a very, uh, a, a, what, what, what I would call a low positive predictive value, that, um, even in the absence of this error term issue. Um, so, and, and in particular, I want to look at what happens with low power even when you do everything else right. Um, I didn't, this is, a, this is very central to the, the modern literature and reproducible research and, and the work of Ioannidis in particular. Uh, and, and his group, but I, I noticed that I don't think we'd had a, there'd been a talk on this yet in this series, so I thought it would be useful to review these concepts, and then I'm going to uh, bring in the error term issues. Um, so um, the, 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 uh, the, to, to frame this, it's useful to adopt the hypothesis testing framework that most medical research um, is done under. Um, and you guys have, I'm sure, have all seen this, but the, the, it, the basic uh, framework is we envision um, a, um, that we're, look, let's just suppose we're looking at an intervention, some sort of treatment. Um, this could be an exposure, uh, but, we're, but we're looking at, let's just suppose for concreteness, we're looking at trying to, trying to evaluate the effect of an intervention. Um, that effect may either be absent, um, and this condition is referred to as the null hypothesis, um, or the effect can be present, um, and that's usually referred to as the research hypothesis. Um, and then we do a study, and the study will have a result, and the result will either be a, um, a negative study, there's not a statistically significant effect of the treatment, or a positive study, there is a statistically significant effect. And anybody who takes like the, even the, ver the very first stats course you get, you spend a lot of time talking about the kinds of errors you can make. Um, and there are two kinds of errors. If the effect is absent, um, and, but you get a positive result, that's a type 1 error. If the effect is present, but you miss it, you fail to detect it, that's a type 2 error. Um, and then, of course, um, you can be correct in two ways. If the effect is present, you can be correct by detecting that effect. If the effect is absent, you can be correct by appropriately failing to detect that effect. You don't detect the effect. Um, the, um, um, but now let's look and I want to picture we have a research program. Some, some body of researchers, this could be a particular lab that is just producing uh, experiments and publishing uh, over a long time period. Could be a particular university and all the work going on at that university. Just some research program that's doing studies and producing uh, um, um, and testing hypotheses, looking at different treatments in different situations. Um, I'm, I'm hypothetically, let, let's just suppose that we have in this research program um, that we're looking at um, dichotomous outcomes, yes, no outcomes, success or failure. Um, and, um, and we're looking at effects of different interventions on the probability um, of failure. Okay. And let's also suppose that the true effects over th throughout this research program vary by this normal distribution that I described here. Um, and, and here, some of the true effects um, are positive, uh, meaning we've increased the proportion of failures. Sometimes they're negative, meaning that the, that the treatment is 
reducing the, 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 the fraction of failures. Um, and, and there's this variation, and, we, and we've set it up so that 90% um, of the time, 90% of these experiments, the true effect ranges between minus 0.2, uh, reflecting a reduction in the failure rate by 0.2 or 20%. Um, and, 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 and so that's one extreme, and the other extreme here is an increase in the failure rate by 20%. And we're just assuming 95% of the time these true effects are in that range. Yeah. So, Tom, are, are you saying that the null hypothesis in this set of studies is confirmed? Well, no, so far we haven't even talked about confirming a hypothesis. What, so I'm. But, but I, I'm having trouble with the difference in proportion. Failures. So this is just refer. Let, we're just looking at. Um, so I'm just to illustrate a point. Uh, just a hypothetical. Um, uh, research program and these what I'm graphing here is this hypothetical distribution of true effects uh, here there's in this scenario essentially none of the true effects are exactly zero this is this is this is propo proposing that that in this program there's really a continuum of effects that have this normal distribution sometimes the true effects are adverse effects indicating that the treatments increase the failure rate. Sometimes they are um, beneficial effects, indicating that the treatments reduce the failure rate. Um, essentially, none of them um, have no effect. There's always, there's usually some increase, you know, there's, there's some effect. This is actually a, a whole other issue, but I don't want to go into it now, about whether you have a positive probability of absolutely zero effect. Um, in some scenarios, that probably is realistic. Many scenarios, probably not. Most, most of the treatments would probably have some effect. It just may be too small to matter. Um, but anyway, we just, you're, you're doing this study. You know, just imagine, or you're, you're, you have this, re you're, this program. You're going along in time. Maybe your first experiment, you get a, a you know, effect of 0.05. That represents a increase in the risk of failure by 5%. The next one, maybe it comes down here. It's a decrease in the risk of failure by 15%. And you just keep doing this over, you keep, you're doing these studies over and over again, and you have all these different failure rates. Again, these, what this graph depicts are the true failure rates, which we don't actually get to observe, right? These are the underlying true rates. Maybe God knows, but we as humans don't know. Um, we could do a really large experiment, and we'll know a little better. We'll get closer to it, but we don't know these rates exactly. Um, so this, hypothetically, let's just suppose this is the situation. Um, but now we actually do, a, we, we, are, we do these experiments and we look at the observed results. Um, and I've set it up, you know, we got a dichotomous outcome. Um, so we could, uh, in a given experiment, we can have a sample size, and I've looked at sample sizes of 30, 120, and 960 there. So different sample sizes where we just observe either 30 responses on this dichotomous outcome, um, 120 or 960. Um, and what we observe then um, is not the black distribution, which represents the distribution of the true effects. We observe these distributions of observed effects. Um, and the distributions of observed effects are more variable than the distributions of the true effects. And, and that's just because we've got some noise um, associated with having finite samples. We call that, statistics statisticians call that sampling error. Right, so we have true variation in treatment effects from um, experiment to experiment. And then on top of that true variation, we have additional variation that's due to sampling error. Um, and the smaller the sample size, uh, like when you get down to a sample size of 30, the more variation you're going to have in the observed effects. And, and, and it goes without saying, as the sample size gets bigger, the closer the distribution of observed effects is going to be to the distribution of true effects. And as the sample size goes to infinity, um, eventually the distribution of observed effects will exactly match the distribution of true effects. Um, so where the, this, this issue of uh, reproducible ability comes in, comes is when you take that scenario um, and then say, well, well we're only going to pay attention to the statistically significant results. 
let's just home in on those results that meet a criteria for statistical significance at, say, the five, well, um, I picked here the, an alpha level of 0.05. So we're going to use the, this conventional cutoff, and we're, we're, and we're just going to highlight those results that reach statistical significance at the 5% level. Um, and um, we're only going to focus on those where we have statistical, statistically significant benefits. We're not going to worry about the harm here. We're just going to focus on benefits. And then among these studies, let's look at this situation. Um, and so this is what is plotted here. This, this is, we now imagine we have the research program. It's doing all these studies. But it's only, we're only going to focus on those where we get statistically significant benefits. Right, because these are the ones that usually drive science. Um, and if we do that, and we just focus on the positive results, if the sample size is small, um, the average observed risk difference to get a statistically significant result is about 40%. So um, among these small studies, when we observe that they're significant, uh, on average, we're going to be seeing really big effects. But remember, when the sample size is small, the variation in these estimated effects is way bigger than the variation in the true effects. And a consequence of this is, this, is that there's a very big difference between the average observed effect and the average true effect among these statistically significant uh, findings. Um, and, and in this case, the average true effect is about 0.1 a huge difference between 0.4 and 0.1. Is, is that the average of all the effects difference? That is the area between 10th and 90th percentile? Or is it an average of two-point estimates at 90 and 10 percent? No, this is the average. Um, what I've depicted here, the black dot, is among all the studies that had a sample size of 30 and um, where a statistically significant result was reported based on a sample size of 30. So these are all the small positive studies. Among all the, po the small positive studies, there was an average benefit of about 10%. Okay? Um, so, there, you know, if you, have a, if you do a salt in this scenario where you start with this uh, nice symmetric distribution of treatment effects like this, you know, if you take all the studies, the average treatment effect is zero. But if we look at among all the studies where we have that are small and where we get a positive result, um, the true treatment effect is going to be, it's not going to be zero anymore. We do learn something when we see positive results in small studies, but we don't learn very much. Uh, um, among those studies that get positive results, the average, of, the average true effect is about minus 10, about minus 0.1 or minus 10 percent. Um, but the observed effect, if we're seeing statistically significant results, is minus 0.4. Right? So the problem is, is that if we home in on, small, if we do a lot of small studies and we, home, and we just focus on those results that are nominally statistically significant, we're going to be dramatically overestimating the size of the benefit, the size of the effect. Um, so let's go on to here again. Yeah, the blue bars, so this represents a, basically, a, it's like a, analogous to a 90% confidence interval. It's not exactly a confidence interval, but it's, it's a probabilistic calculation. Yeah, so it's among these, po uh, these positive small studies, 90% of the time, this true benefit ranges somewhere between actually a slight harm and a benefit of about 19%. Right? So there's some variation there. So there's still a good many of those studies uh, where there was actual harm, even though we reported this massive statistically significant benefit. Pardon? Yeah, this is under this no that nice this normal, dis normal distribution. Under that hypothetical well, scenario. That's right. Right. At different distributions, this would look a little different, but you would still see the same qualitative pattern. So does the average, the blue, the black line with the blue bar, yeah. so does the average be incorporating the 10th to the 90th percent? Yeah. So you're incorporating 80% of, of the estimates. Uh, does that mean that as the 
difference between the black dot and the red dot yeah. gets greater and greater, you have more egregious outliers uh, influencing the red dot. Um, well, not necessarily outliers from the standpoint of individual observations, which is usually what we mean by an outlier. But I guess what you might be... I mean, in terms of the study. In terms of the study, I think you might say that. They're, the study's results are just so noisy, so variable when they're small. Um, and the only way you can reach statistical, statistical significance in a really small study is to have a really big effect size. Right. And, and so it's just we're seeing, yeah, it's, in a way it's the extreme of the sampling distribution that we, that we have to sample from in order to get statistically significant results. And that's what leads to this big discrepancy. Um, and then as the sample size is bigger, this discrepancy starts to go down, but not as fast, I think, as human intuition would suggest, at least when I talk to people. Uh, uh, the, when you look at a sample size of 60 and you get a statistically significant result in a setting like this, um, you know, the, the average effect you're going to have to have to get that statistical significance is about 30%. Uh, the true average effect, again, is about 0.10 or so, maybe 0.11 or 12. Still like a threefold difference. Um, sample size of 120, maybe you get that difference down to closer to twofold. Um, so, and it keeps getting smaller, but you really have to get big sample sizes, 480, 960 or so, to get this difference to the point where you could really be confident that given you're reporting a statistically significant result, that the true, re true effect is probably comparable to your um, estimated effect. What Otherwise, you're probably overestimating it. Why yeah. we think that that curve should grow faster? I mean, that's the derivative of the normal distribution. Well, I, I would say these aren't necessarily mathematically inclined people. <laughs> but yeah, that, that, but that the... Grows, uh, essentially, it grows like the derivative yeah. of the normal no, it's, it, if you know the math, this is just the consequence of the math, and it then becomes intuitive. But no, I think, gosh, you just see um, constantly, uh, like, you know, these basic science studies, the N of 10, dichotomous outcome. You think you've learned something with the 80% turn out one, you know, turn out one way. You learn, that's like a sample size of 10. This is 30, the, the lowest I even went. Uh, um, at least my experience, in t uh, not necessarily, if, if, you, if you invoke the mathematical framework and you're really talking math, I think people will start to get this more. But just in, in when you're just interpreting your everyday research that's going on, the daily research that you're perhaps close to, you, you, it's, it's our, our human brain, I don't think, is very good at realizing how much this chance variation impacts your, your reported findings. Um, you, you know, I'm, th I'm talking the average basic scientist working here at the university, yeah. or the average clinical, the, cl the average clinician working at the university. I, I just rejected a paper. You, usually not, but I yeah. I just rejected a paper with uh, the results from six pigs. Yeah. It would have been helpful if I Yeah, heard yeah, heard yeah. No, so it's, uh, so this is, um, and so, um, I mean, the, the, the upshot of this is, is really that a attending to those results that reach statistical significance um, leads you to dramatically overestimate um, the size of, of the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the effects that you're studying. Um, and this is more true when you're doing small studies than big studies. But most studies are small studies. Um, now, um, Another way that this is sometimes framed um, is to just look at an individual study. Um, and in this framework, um, we're now not, not, we're not going to be uh, formulating this continuous distribution of treatment effects anymore. We're just going to look at a single trial. And, and we're just going to consider uh, that the null hypothesis might be true and the research hypothesis might be true. Um, so this is a somewhat different framework. Um, um, and this is the, the main one that I think you see in Ian Eadie's articles. Um, and the, these conclusions that are, that are reached about the f most research, uh, what's the headline, something like, you know, that most medical research studies are false. Yes, yeah. You know, th 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 this traces back to this argument. Um, and um, the, um, basically the idea here is, again, you, you posit this concept of a research program. 
right? So you have some, some program, and could be an individual group of researchers, a university, the entire medical estab research establishment, just some defined research program. Um, and we're, this program is going along and it's test, doing a bunch of different studies and testing null hypotheses of no effect versus there is an effect. Um, and there's a, the quantity R here is a property of the way this research, of the kinds of uh, hypothesis this research program tests. Um, and it represents the ratio of the number of true effects to the number of null effects in this program. So what's the fraction? So R is 1. This means that there is a even odds, a 1 to 1 ratio of studies where there really is a true effect versus studies where there is no effect uh, by this research program. Okay. R greater than 1 means most of the time there is a true effect for this particular research program. R being low means that usually there's no effect. And, and um, so this is just a prop. So you can think of this R as a measure of, of focus, perhaps. To what extent is this research program evaluating hypotheses that have strong preliminary evidence to support them? Right. So, are you? I mean, is there, are we looking at trials that are only done um, when the research hypothesis is very strongly supported by prior evidence? Um, that would be a high R. Um, I, I, another way I think of high R is um, well-defined hypotheses that um, that have a strong basis in um, in prior work. Highly focused. Some yeah. Of the magnitude of the effect plays here because I mean there are things like uh, are so certain that yeah uh, one will do it. I mean yeah. In I this think, framework, and this is a criticism of this framework, um, which is why I led I with mean, the, the intensity. I mean, you have a system, yeah. And you perturbate the system. Right. Right. The, the intensity of the response of the system to the stimulus. I, I don't see that. In this case, the size of the effect is not an implicit part of this framework. It comes in in the power. Um, and so the bigger the effect, the higher the so power the is going to be. Is done at the limit of the small effects. No, no, this is just, it's discrete. We're no longer thinking of some, don't think of it as a continuum of effects anymore. The effect is either not there or it's there. Absent versus present in a single trial. This is a categorical that yes. evokes, in my mind, uh, the construct of prevalence of disease. Yes. When you're looking at predictive values, although it's not prevalence, that's it's right. a ratio of, of the null to the... I, I think that's a good analogy. And the uh, positive predictive value terminology even comes from diagnostic testing about presence versus absence of a disease. Um, but this is also the criticism of this particular framework. It's just what you said, Julio. It doesn't explicitly mo try to model the distribution of true effects. Um, it's kind of hard. Like you pointed out when I did that distribution that I just made up a scenario where, it was n where these true effects were normally distributed. Of course, I just made that up. In reality, they're not going to be normally distributed. So it's, it's a... Uh, so, that, so that, that framework is a little more abstract, and this is a little simpler and more concrete, but you're, you, it doesn't invoke that. We're not really referring to distribution of true effect sizes in the, here. So that, that's just ignored. Um, we're just envisioning, we're just doing a series of dichotomous hypothesis tests. Either the research hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is true. Um, and then R is the fraction of times in this scenario that the research hypothesis is true. Um, and um, speaking vaguely, we can think of R again as, a, as, I would say, the focus of the research program. Are they just testing hypotheses willy-nilly, um, like just on a lark, without a lot of prior uh, reasoning and prior evidence to support hypotheses, um, or are they focusing in on hypotheses that have strong grounds for uh, belief or, 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 or credibility. Um, you know, it, it, uh, low R is also the more exploratory se setting. So a lot of genetics research, you're just simply checking, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of genes for are any of them correlated with some phenotype. That's very exploratory. R is going to be very low in that setting. Um, so that's, you can also think of low R as a highly exploratory setting, high R as a highly confirmatory setting. Um, so anyway, um, with R and with this type 1 error alpha, which is the usual alpha we are, you, most of us are familiar with, that we usually set at 5% or 1% or in that range, um, you can, there's a relationship between the power and R in the type 1 error and the positive predictive value of the, the research result. Positive predictive value um, represents the conditional probability that given you have a positive finding, so you, you reach statistical significance in your study, what fraction of those studies really represent true research hypotheses? What, so when you report a positive finding, what's the fraction of the time that that's a true positive as opposed to a false positive? So when, what fraction of your claims of statistically significant results really are true results? Those are just all different ways of talking about positive predictive value in this setting, right? Um, and this was a kind of, I'll have to say, even for me, this concept, I remember thinking about this, oh, maybe in the 90s. Uh, I'd already been a statistician 10 years before this really occurred to me. And um, the, um, this comes up in clinical trials a lot. Um, we tip, tip, there's a, was a false notion that I think most people had for a long time that as long as you kept alpha, you're 1 or 5%, that somehow guarantees a type 1 error. I mean, in, in some sense, that does guarantee a type 1 error of 1 or 5%. And we think, well, maybe we're okay even if we do an underpowered trial and we get a positive result. We should still be okay reporting that result, shouldn't we? Because the alpha was low. We're still guaranteed the alpha of 1 or 5%. Um, but when you think about it a little bit, alpha really isn't the quantity of interest in terms of interpreting a positive result. The quantity of interest when you're interpreting what's the implication of having a positive finding is the positive predictive value. Um, and um, it was really, at least for me, I became very conscious of that dis distinction somewhere in the 90s. And, the, um, um, and, and this is a curve with R of 1 over 4. Um, so one, in, one research hypothesis being true for every, for, uh, versus 4. Uh, studies where the research hypothesis is not true and the null hypothesis is true. This is probably, I think, a pretty realistic setting. Um, most, I mean, when you look at statistics about, um, in the, in like drug development or in randomized trial settings, um, the fraction of treatments that actually, that are being evaluated that it actually end up working is, is relatively low. And so maybe I, I think of this R as maybe applying to the real world set investigation of drugs. Um, um, anyway, um, when alpha is 0.05, um, this is the relationship between power and the positive predictive value, um, and, and when R is, is 1 over 4. Um, and what you can see here is that for this fairly typical situation, if the true power is low, the positive predictive value can be pretty low. You know, uh, so even though alpha might be 0.05, we might envision, well, that should guarantee a positive predictive value of 95%. You know, it's kind of like, I think we kind of think that way. You know, 1 minus 0.05 is 0.95. So we should be right about 95% of the time if we use an alpha of 0.05. But that's just not true. The positive predictive value can be quite a bit uh, lower than that um, in, in, in settings where the true power is low. Um, now, true power is another concept that's tricky. Most everybody, when they write their study, they claim they have 80% or 90% power. Um, but very often, that's a very baseless claim. Um, and that claim is based on the assumption of a very large effect size that maybe is observed you know, once every lifetime, one in a million studies. Could, I mean, it's amazing the effect sizes people will, will hypothesize. Um, the power that you should think of here is the power for the biologically plausible effect, the effect that really is plausible in that scenario. Um, and it's, 
there's a lot discussed on this. Of course, this so, is. So one would be that always that you do that intervention produce the effect. Um, a power of one would mean that if there is a true effect uh, of, of the designated size, you have a 100% chance of detecting for, it. For instance, if I, I use a very toxic substance and I inject that to an animal, yeah. that's always dead. Okay, that, 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 that actually doesn't, uh, well, I guess that does translate the power in a way, but what you're describing is more closely related to the true effect size. Right. That's correct. Right. It, you know, another example: if you take a pistol and you shoot somebody shoot in the head, they're, they're they're always going to die. <laughs> it's very deterministic, um, and um, and if you you know, and if your null hypothesis is that there's a 50/50 chance, the effect is much larger. Yeah, very large, and that's right. Yeah, but but fundamentally, power just represents in whatever your situation. It's the probability that you're going to detect an, an effect that's actually present. So it's essentially the ratio in between the explicit variables effects and the latent variables effects? Uh, no, th I think that's a different concept. Latent versus fixed variables here. This is much just conditional on that there's a true effect. What's the chance that you're going to, so that you're going to meet your cri whatever the study's criteria for statistical significance? Yeah, the latent variables is re also relevant to this discussion, but that's a different, a different direction. Yeah. So I want to follow up Julio's comment. Uh, I understand this because I'm used to thinking about prevalence and predictive yeah. value, both for negative and positive right. tests. But uh, to follow Julio's uh, suggestion, you're uh, helping us with arguments that are based on scenarios in which uh, random uh, effects yeah. are operative. Right. As opposed to... Well, where sampling error is operative. Yes. Systems. Right, right. So if we had 1,000 people yeah. jumping out of airplanes, flying at 10,000 right. feet, and they're doing it without parachutes <laughs> and without glide right, suits, right. I mean, we pre have a pretty yeah. well-established deterministic system. Fair enough. That wouldn't involve much impact yes. of random variation right. of confounders sure. and other things. Uh, so um, you're looking at the situation. It, it, it's um, a bi you're looking at we have a binary variable, death or al dead or alive, and when you look at situations where everybody dies, the variance of that binary variable is zero. Right. If if it's a f straight coin fl flip, um, the probability is 0.5, and the variance is 0.5 times 0.5 is point you know is 0.25, right? So you're you're um, you you have more variation when um, when you're looking at a binary variable that the probability of a success is somewhere intermediate between zero and one, um, and and that variation gets really small when your probability of success is essentially one or essentially zero. Um, so that, that is true. Um, that's not real. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I mean, you can have good power even when you have, um, even when the true probabilities are in this intermediate range of around 0.5, just by having an adequate sample size. Because you compensate. Yeah. Right. So, so it's um, not necessarily that there's any particular role in this discussion of, uh, of, zero, of, of situations where you have 100% or 0% probability of success. The coefficients of all the other variables will average to zero. Um, it, they, they, they don't correlate with, with the one that you are measuring. OK, yeah, yes. Uh, so um, let's just, so, yeah, so for the purpose of this one, it's probably easiest if we just assume we're doing randomized studies. Okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm not addressing confounding here, okay. right? We're just, uh, we're just looking at the issue of sampling error. Yeah. Uh, but, but confounding but is another source of error, uh, so and that's... Uh, you are dealing with the error in the measurement. The er me measurement error and sampling error, uh, right? So you, can, uh, you could have, uh, there could be no measurement error. So, so, uh, we could, so let's say we're looking at dead or alive. Yeah. So let's assume we can detect that without error. And um, um, the, the question is, does the treatment improve the probability of survival, right? So there's not measurement error, but there's definitely sampling error. You know, you may, the treatment may increase the probability of survival from 0.5 to 0.6, but there's going to be a good bit of sampling error um, around those values. 
I may be missing something here, but my understanding is these arguments are built on a foundation of statistical uncertainty and randomness. Yeah. We're testing with the p-value whether we can explain the variation based on random distributions alone. Uh, with yes. With effect size. So uh, if we're in a situation that's quite deterministic, yeah. where we would say there's no real argument that there are randomly operating uh, variables yeah. determining yeah. this outcome, then this becomes non, not applicable. I think that's, a, that's correct. You don't need it. You don't, you don't, we don't need to do studies uh, with statistical calculations if it's, so there, there may be some examples of that, and, um, maybe in physics, where, you, where just the sample size of one is all you need. Um, you know, but, but there's usually measurement error, there's usually, there's usually so some noise, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your research question is, is what happens when you uh, shoot somebody with a 50 caliber weapon in the temple and you want to, you know, maybe in that case the sample size of one is all you need. <laughs> <laughs> but you probably don't need a sample size of, you don't even need to do a study. There, there, there may be some case, I, th I think you have to get to pretty, pretty um, uh, unrealistic examples like that, though, to get to those, yeah. those scenarios. And then a related issue is belief on the part of the investigators. So the power is, as I understand it, uh, very much determined by the belief of the investigators in some prior probability that some event is likely or unlikely. You, um, you're thinking of a Bayesian formulation. Yeah. And you, um, you can look at the issue of power in a Bayesian context. And so then prior knowledge about the likely size of treatment effects can come into play there. Um, but, but no, this, this is, um, you don't need that. You can just use a straight frequentist framework um, and, and prior belief doesn't have to come into it. Um, this is conditional on the research hypothesis being true, right? And, th and just hypothetically, if the research hypothesis is true, what's the probability that our experiment will be able to detect that true hypothesis? And so we, that's, that conditional probability is defined irrespective of our prior belief in that research hypothesis. I understand, but when we're, when we're planning together yeah. a study, then oh. somebody says, well, what, oh, do, you now think, I hear what you. do you think the research, okay. uh, the, the probability of the research hypothesis being true yes. is? So that's I think what you're, where you're coming from would be applicable to coming up with the effect size that you should calculate power with respect to. Um, that does have to do, I think you could say, with belief. Ideally, it, that belief is based, is grounded on the body of scientific evidence. But what is the plausible biological effect? Um, so that, that is perhaps, I think that is where that comes in. Okay, but um, just, to, just so we can move on a little bit, um, the, um, um, the relationship is, is that if the true power is low relative to whatever the actual biologically plausible effect size is, um, that even with an alpha of 0.05, um, you can get very low positive predictive values. Um, the um, one way to think about this is a randomized trial um, is usually just barely powered to get the biologically plausible effect in the full sample size, if you're lucky. Um, um, and, and, and maybe your people do a subgroup analysis with uh, half the patients. In that scenario, power is going to be down around 0.5. If you look at a smaller subgroup, power will, could easily be 0.2 something. It happens a lot. Um, there's a lot of cases where people are doing underpowered studies with where you can make the argument that the true power is in that 20, 30, 40 percent range. It's not uncommon. Um, and if those studies are positive, this is just saying that positive predictive value will be low. Um, the positive predictive value depends a lot on R. This is analogous to the concept of prevalence. Um, in, the, in, in, the, in, a, uh, in the diagnostic testing setting. 
uh, the positive, higher the prevalence, the higher the positive predictive value. Uh, and, and so this is what is, is, is shown there. If research program is more focused, more of the positive results are going to signify true effects than if the research program is really exploratory or, or unfocused. And even with the power of one and an R, oh, the R of one is only yeah, is the, only the, 50 /50. that's right. That's why that doesn't yeah, go that's up why to it one. Doesn't rise to one. Gotcha. Now, um, this gets exacerbated when you have non-selective reporting. Uh, I mean, when you have selective reporting, when, when, when in reality the investigators are doing multiple tests, multiple checks of the hypothesis. Um, and when this happens, the pos you can see this, um, you know, power is still a factor, but the number of independent looks at the data to test the hypothesis is also driving down positive predictive value. And look, if R is 1 over 8 and you're doing eight looks at the data and you're reporting the one that looks the most significant or the one that confirms the hypothesis the most out of those eight, uh, positive predictive value is pretty close to 0.2 throughout the whole range of power. So multiple looks, of course, is another big, big issue. Um, this is another thing where I think the human brain um, is, or the human mind deceives itself so easily. I, I can't tell you how many experiences I've had working with investigators that fully understand all these arguments mathematically, but when it comes to their research data, um, and when you've done the eight looks at the data, the correct look is always the one that supports the hypothesis. Uh, and, and there's all, usually we can come up with extraordinarily good post hoc reasons for ignoring the other seven looks. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this would mean um, you look at the data, the results negative, so you check it a little bit and you say, oh, wait a minute, we should have excluded that mouse. Let's oh, drop so that it mouse. Selective, selective, selective reporting. Selective. Or you, 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 you start pruning your, you your... Yeah, you, you start jiggering the way the analysis is done. You start so picking... This is not a random selective reporting. This is... Yes, this is... That's right. This is selective reporting where you're picking the most favorable result to report. So you pick the result that's most supportive of your hypothesis. Is this also and true of using eight different variables and saying, well, the populations don't differ? Yeah, on the similar to that. Pressure, yeah, but they do differ. On that's the right. Or, or eight different subgroups, eight different outcomes, all these sorts of things. So now, it's a little more complicated than this because I'm assuming independence between the different looks. And usually you don't have full independence, but even without, even it's under many realistic scenarios, it doesn't look much different this is than this. Than the and other yes, of that's right. Animals. That's right. The thing is, is that usually the, the, because of the sort of this diabolical trick our minds play on us, we we do this. I think we do all do this all the time, and we don't realize it. This uh, and 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 people are going through uh, their research, and oh, sometimes this is evolving over a period of years. And, and observing their accumulating data, making decisions that seem realistic and highly justified to them, and then they kind of forget that there is that step involved. Um, and um, I've actually seen my, and I know this is human, very, you know, I'm a statistician, I think about these things a lot. I, several times, well, I don't know how many, many times I've caught myself uh, even, you know, being tempted to do something that I realize is this post hoc kind of multiple look and finding good reasons why the other looks shouldn't be considered. Um, it's almost impossible for us to do this, um, for us not to fall into this trap, unless we build, the only way around it is you have to build in processes to prevent it. You have to develop algorithms and processes for the conduct of research that just don't give the opportunity for post hoc selection of what analyses to report. Because if you give that opportunity, our mind, we're going to be fooled by our, our minds. We just can't, we can't help ourselves. So yeah? This is totally, I mean, it's related to this. And so then this idea of transparency, when this gets reported into yeah. the literature, and how is that, I mean, me, I'm just kind of a lady. Yeah. How, how, how do I understand that, whether they did post hoc? You can't tell. Um, and let, you know, the only way, 
random, because um, people don't necessarily report what the nine things they did. They should, ethically they should, but um, you know, the combination of, oh, they've forgotten, it's not important, these other analyses were worse analyses, they weren't appropriate, what an idiot I was to even thought about doing those analyses, they're just a bad idea, if I report them it's just cluttering the literature with irrelevant detail, the journals give you these tight page limits and they don't allow you to present it all, the journal's going to reject the article if you give all those gory details, I get that a lot as a statistician arguing for people to, to give these, this kind of information. Uh, the perception of most, you know, uh, the, the whole process discourages you from doing it. Because um, if you report all this information, the, the, it's too complicated, it's not the main point of the paper, it's uh, all these things come into play. And, and so there's huge incentives by investigators not to report those gory details. Yeah. Just to follow that, uh, not only are there incentives not to report all of the details of statistical methods, yeah. the same incentives uh, preclude reporting all of the details of decision making during the conduct of the experiment. Oh, sure. So most protocols yeah. leave all kinds of decisions. Good to point. Bed, to bedside yeah, decisions. actually, that's very related to this. I, and if you're and if you're accumulate, and this is a problem when you when you these decisions are based on the accumulating data, that actually is lead, leads to selective reporting because you're only reporting, uh, uh, you, you know, you're not reporting the results of the of the decisions you didn't take. Uh, Julio. I, I try to use things like unsupervised classification methods to, if you are going to say, I'm not, oh. gonna, I mean, if I'm going to separate the analysis in two groups, yeah. I mean, I should have evidence that these two groups separate in an unsupervised classification. Um, well, you need to do, you need to build into the probabilistic uh, interpretation of the results and the, and the strength of the conclusions the quantity of looks you're doing. And, the, and that all has to be framed and spelled out in advance. I mean, that's fundamentally it. Or, and, or, or and a posteriori, should, they should separate naturally by classification without supervision. What does unsupervised mean? Does that mean you have an automatic algorithm that doesn't require that's human decision? Basically, just finding patterns. Yeah. That would be very, a very so exploratory. A replicable method for analysis. Yeah. Now, what, th that's what I'm interpreting. Yeah, and, and what I, I think that's the key, is the replicable, replicable methodology. Fundamentally, this means we need to look at, we need to do, I, mean, this, I think the next one, yeah, so these combinations, low power, evaluation of unsupported or ill-posed hypotheses, which gives you that low R, uh, multiplicity of analyses and only reporting the strongest one. Those things combine to generate this conclusion uh, based on Ian Eadie's research that suggests to him that some of these things are usually happen, uh, that most medical f research findings that are reported as statistically significant and positive are in fact false. So that, that, that's where that argument comes from. I mean, I, uh, I'm not going to get it. I think there, there's, there's issues with it, but the general gist of it is clear. Uh, and, and I, I, I accept the, um, I don't accept the conclusion in a, if, if you, in a precisely stated way for a variety of reasons. There's just a lot of layers of complexity, um, but I accept the gist of it, I would say. And, and that these bad practices are leading to a lot of biases in, in, in the research that's reported. Um, so I definitely accept that. There's so many complexities, if we go into them, we'll, we'll end up, yeah. We have 10 minutes? Yeah, <laughs> it'll take a lot more than 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and so I barely, yeah, I'll just barely get, maybe I'll do another talk in the spring or something. Uh, so, so, um, so, that, so there's that. Um, so that's just the basic framework. So even if you don't get the error term wrong, we still confront all the things that we just talked about. But then there's the whole error term issue. And I just, I'm gonna um, just mention, um, I think we just have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna go through. This is a formative experience, you know, I, we all have our formative experiences in our career. This is one I had in graduate school. Um, and I was a, you know, a graduate research assistant. 
uh, at Cornell, and there was a plant science laboratory where this, we, a couple of students would be would work with the plant scientists and, and help them uh, with their experiments and and with their anal and, and analyzing their data. Um, and they are um, analyzing different fertilizers, environmental exposures on plant growth and crop yield, um, and. It, the way they, these are indoor experiments in this laboratory, and the way their experiments had been set up, um, this, I don't, for a good bit of time, this had been going on for at least a decade. Um, um, and actually not just at this lab, but at similar labs around the country, is they have, um, they arrange their plants, uh, usually multiple plants within a pot, and then multiple pots would be placed on a turntable and then there would be a shower head over the turntable and they would just douse the plants with whatever the treatment would be. Um, and uh, it's just convenient to have one treatment applied to all the plants, you know, per turntable. So you give turntable one, they all get one treatment. Turntable two, they all get another treatment. Turntable three, they get a third treatment. Why were they turning? Uh, oh. I, I think that's just to make sure that there's an even distribution of whatever is coming out of the shower on all the plants, perhaps. Um, so anyway, they, um, um, so that's the, that's the setup here. Um, and the issue is when you do this statistically, um, it, 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 when we define the error term here, it's also another way of framing of this is what's the unit of analysis? Um, one way you could do this is basically assume that there's random, that, that the plants are, that the actual individual plants are independent. Their outcomes are independent of one another. And you could do this analysis at the plant level. And if you do that, the error term has to do with the, it's based on the variation in the outcome, the crop yield, say, between the different plants. Now, the people I worked with thought they were quite sophisticated and said, no, no, we're not going to do that. We realized that would be the wrong error term because they knew that the plant, that, that assumes independence of the uh, crop yields between the plants in the same pot, and they knew that wasn't plausible. Biologically, the plants would interact if they were in the same pot. Uh, but there was no physiological way they could think of for why the, the outcomes of the plants in different pots would be related. They, surely we can assume that the outcomes are independent from pot to pot. Um, and um, that also means they have to assume that the whole process by which they douse the plants when they, with the shower, uh, that there's no difference from one shower head to another, that, that the experiment is done in a way that there really is no difference in terms of experimental mechanism from turntable to turntable. And they were sure there couldn't be. Um, and so anyway, I was the grad student, and they're, and they're presenting this to me. And I, um, 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 you know, I confronted them. I said, like, you know, this, is, uh, th this seems like a pretty difficult to verify assumption. Um, but they were absolutely adamant. They, there was no scientific possible way that there could be any correlation in results from pot to pot uh, within the, on the same turntable. And so what that meant was is they would do this study um, with, hmm. oh, I've got something that's objecting. Oh, I'll remind me later. OK. Um, so they're going to do this analysis as though there's a sample size of six within each turntable. So basically, they'll say there are six um, pots getting treatment one, six getting treatment two, six getting treatment three. You would analyze this as though there's a sample size of 18. Thank you. And, um, and then compare the results and look at the effect of the treatments. And this is the design they'd actually been using for many years and other, other labs as well. Um, but anyway, I um, mentioned this to uh, my, basically my, you know, the, my faculty advisor for the work and describe the scenario to him. And, uh, and, and I had mentioned that, you know, I, this seemed, seemed a little bit shaky to me, but they were certain of this, so I told them it was okay. They, they could proceed to, uh, to, to do the, the work the way they, they, they described. 
And my advisor, I mean, just gave me the most intensive dressing down you could imagine that, you know, never again was I to allow that in my whole career. It's just malpractice to ever let experimenters get by with that kind of reasoning. And um, <laughs> it has stuck with me. And, and the, the interesting thing is that um, um, be because it became apparent this had been their research practice for a long time, um, the, the statisticians got together and they designed an experiment to actually test their hypothesis that there was no turntable effect, that there was no common, uh, you know, that were they really correct in, in pretending and acting as though these pots were, the, the outcomes were independent. Um, and it turned out, in, in fact, that they were not. There was a pretty substantial uh, turntable effect. And they had envisioned, when they were doing their studies, when what they thought was an alpha of 0.05, the true alpha level was more like 0.25. Um, so it was just radically off. Um, and this just happens, uh, this is one of those other subtle things that we have trouble uh, dealing with. But the fundamental flaw here is that the structure of their experiment allows there to be this error. You know, you, you, you um, they, they may think that it's not there, you may reason that it's not there, but that's, a, that, that's just the fundamental uh, assumption. Um, and it may not be true. And so if we design an experiment correctly, you don't allow the results to be susceptible to an assumption like that. What was the interaction? Was, I, I don't know if they ever found the physical cause. But, they, but there is just something about, you, you provided the opportunity for there to be systematic differences from one turntable to the well, other. Why did you do the experiment to calibrate the instrument? I mean, first thing that you do is you calibrate yeah. your instrument. Um, I think this is more, it's calibration, I think scientists all get, because that has to do with systematic but bias. Reason, but but this, the... this is different than calibration, though. This, is, this has to do with this issue of chance variation. And I would have run the same experiment in the triple table. Yeah. I mean, that's, to me, that's right. calibration of my Yeah, I see. Maybe I, I see your point. But anyway, to do this, they have to do things like have two turntables for each, um, for each uh, treatment. And then, the, and then the error term would be based on the variation between the turntables. And then you can call it independent. Um, and, but when you're looking at pots on the same turntable, all getting the same treatment, but, no, but you're, then you're the stuck. Would be two, not six. Exactly. Well, it'd be two, two per treatment, so you would get two. Two groups of six. Yeah. It, 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 but yeah. So um, anyway, and you can do a little evaluation here about what's the true alpha level if we ignore this kind of. Uh, uh, this is basically autocorrelation. That, right, if we, if we do the analysis as though the smaller unit is the unit of analysis, like the pot, but where the true unit is something bigger, like the turntable, how big the error is going to be. Um, and it depends heavily on how strong the correlation is, as well, at, which is what I've in indicated by rho there, but also on um, the number, the, the n here is like the number of pots on the turntable, right? Now, this happens. And you, basically, you can see here that if you have scenarios where the bigger unit has a lot of smaller units in it, like say 64, um, even for tiny correlations, correlations that are really, we'd usually think of these as negligible, you can still have big inflations in the nominal alpha. Um, and then if you have a, like a moderately high correlation and you, you, and you use the wrong units or the wrong error term, uh, alpha can just be inflated astronomically. Um, and it's just amazing how common this is. And it, it, you still see it, per, you know, it, it, in medical journals today. This is repeated all the time. Um, the, um, I just put a few examples here, and these are debates and struggles that our little statistics groups has with all these groups right now. The um, ophthalmologists love to do the analysis as though eyes in the same person could be treated independently. So that doubles their sample size. Um, so that's, you know, dentists love to think of all the teeth as being independent. There's, so there's no correlation in, the, in outcomes between different teeth in the same person. Orthopedists, left arm and right arm should be independent. Um, the biggest thing is the basic sciences. And the, the, they're, um, they're, they're very often treating groups of animals, and they like to put 
um, you know, the animals are usually in cages or some sort of, uh, you know, cells or something. And they love to give all the animals in the same cage the same treatment. Um, and that's an example of this too. They treat the animals as though they're independent. But if they put them, if they're grouped in cages, the cages then become um, the broader unit of analysis. And I honestly don't know how often this leads to this inflation and type 1 error that I just talked about, but I'm very suspicious about it. And this is almost universal. I mean, I, I, when I drill down, you usually don't know this right away, but when you drill down to what they're doing, I'm going to guess two out of three lab experiments have this issue. The, 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 um, um, and sometimes it got <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'll close with this. Uh, this is, this is a, a real example, although I've forgotten the numbers, so I've sort of, but it's close. Um, so these guys had six mice per cage for four cages. They were giving each cage a different treatment. Um, and they were looking at survival. And I was thinking, oh, your sample size is way too small. You're never going to see an effect. And they said, no, we have a huge effect. <laughs> but what they had done is um, all, the, all the mice that got the first treatment um, survived 15 days, but one who maybe survived 16 days. Then the next treatment, they all survived 20 days. The next treatment, 24 days. The next treatment, 28 days, with maybe one, except, one or two exceptions. And so they had this extraordinarily regular uh, outcome, and it's like, Biology is never that regular. I just can't believe that you can determine exactly how many days they're going to survive by your treatment. There's always variation. Uh, how, can there, how can there not be variation? And, and so what turned out, and this took like many iterations of back and forth to actually extract this out of them, is survival was based on, um, you know, they looked at the, the, the cage, and when the mice in the cage kind of collectively looked like they were doing pretty badly, they would euthanize them. And so, you know, they just built in this dependence from cage to cage and got this highly significant result by doing that. They, they killed them and then reported survival? Yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> That's actually very common. You got to be kidding. That's very common in the basic sciences. They very often, there's a, they euthanize, at the end of the day, both for scientific purposes and I think for humanitarian purposes, there's a euthanization time. And survival is very common. Now you could get by with that if they do careful step blinding, double blinding, and uh, you know careful randomization of the mice across cages and things like that. But they don't. Um, it's usually separate cages, separate treatments in each cage, and you know none of those precautions are taken. Um, and then that's um, that would also be true if you had six cages in exposure chamber one and six cages in exposure chamber two. Well, yeah, you would still yeah, have that issue. You would still have that interaction. Right, you would still have that issue. It would be qu not quite as <laughs> severe as this, but you would still have it to a degree. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so maybe sometime I can give another talk on so this, this area. Pardon? They don't run a blank experiment. Do nothing to oh. these animals and see what the variation is in the blank. Well, I don't think it, and, I mean, you know, I, I don't think it occurs to, I'm not sure what the, all the reasoning is there. Um, so I, I guess I don't know about that. But I mean, uh, but the, wouldn't you do that to get the base? Yeah, because yeah. Because then you can use those spreads. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, it's often way more subtle than this. And the bias is sometimes smaller. This is like extraordinarily, you know, massive. But it's, it's usually, it usually is harder to see. Um, and the consequences are not as dramatic. Uh, but that definitely goes on all the time. Um, and and I, um, they, when I talk to them about fixing this issue, it's usually just not feasible. That the cost of, um, for example, um, you know, like they have four treatments. Oh, I should have said treatment one, two, three, and four. Sorry, that was a typo there. Um, but they, you know, you could have four mice per cage and give different treatments to, those, to the different mice in the cage. Um, th that would be another way to design this, where you don't confound the cage with the treatment. And you, could, and you could do it. You could get it correct. That's what uh, Fisher did in his original agricultural experiment. Yeah. He divided the plot. Oh, yeah. Plot, right. And then in each plot, he made rows. And yeah. Row you could. Um, that's true. And you could. Um, but, but the reasoning is logistics. Apparently, it's very difficult to. Like even tell the mice apart. 
Um, so, so which mo if you if you gave different treatments to the different mice in the same cage, they would lose track of which mice mouse was which, and then just administering the treatments to different mice in the same cage differently is often very logistically difficult. Or just good reasons, you know, logistically why it's hard to do. But uh, if you don't do it, you you do have this this issue. You can also do the other way around, which is, is what I call calibration of your instrument. Yeah. Because you run blanks, so you know your biases in the in the how you measure things, and then you correct your measurements by. by sure. I, mean, I think that people. Yeah, you're right. People in the, the animal think. I mean, that that's the way that you think in, in a yeah. physics. Yeah. But this is all going on now. I would say, and th and these all these things that I've talked about and 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 more, uh, trace back to this error term issue. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's a kind of an underappreciated uh, issue for reproducibility. Uh, th this is most illuminating. Thank you so much. I is this uh, reflected in clinical studies in the site effect? Yes, that's because, exactly. Because each hospital, I mean, no hospital yeah. has a random selection of patients. Everybody has a yeah. convenient sample of people who arrive at the doorstep of the hospital. Right. And then the hospital has all of its own foibles. That's right. And and biases. Yeah. So this is if you don't find a side effect, then you argue that for the particular study and outcome under examination, that these biases were unimportant. Is well, your the side effect issue are clustering by site or by provider. There are other examples of the same thing, um, and um, so that that's certainly true. Um, whether you, uh, the issue of you do a little test and if you don't see significance then you assume it doesn't exist, that's another thing. Um, um, it turns out that actually doesn't protect you fully. It's probably better to do that than not to, than to just assume there's no side effect. But, um, there are frequently very but few sites. That's right. You don't have power to do that so test. You don't have the yeah. To exclude it. That's true. Okay, well, we've used the hour up. I don't want to hold you guys. Uh, too long, so thank you. Thank you. That was terrific. Well, thank you.